Uh, my talk is about robotics for rehabilitation, um, talking about challenges and opportunities. And the, the, gr the work that we do at the University of Leeds is we're trying to develop new robotic technology to meet the grand challenge on human health and independent living. So if people ask me uh, which, what, are, what is the area that I work, I would use one word, um, we either biorobotics or biomechatronics. So by the word, you know that there's an interdisciplinary area involves not just mechanical, but electrical, uh, computing, artificial intelligence, and of course with robotics and the neuroscience. A lot of uh, uh, research organizations realize the importance of this field due to the, the potential in medical devices area. Uh, in terms of applications, you have seen different type of robots in, used in many different fields, from nano robots used to treat cancer cells, to macro robots that can swing in your blood, to exoskeletons that you wear in your daily life. Okay. So the drivers for new technologies in the field, uh, you can see there's a societal drivers. Um, one is due to aging of population. You see people in this room with gray hair, the same as me, so uh, uh, the numbers are increasing. And also uh, people with disability, uh, you're talking about 15% of population with disability. Uh, we talked about stroke uh, just before. Uh, countries like India and China have uh, 2 to 2.5 million strokes every year. Okay, so it's uh, fast increasing. There's also cost of health care and burden in daily life. The other type of driver is the technological driver. I know with the uh, new technologies, new sensors, robotics, and the AI that drives the development of new solutions in the field. There's also the third driver called clinical drivers. I will try to uh, improve the treatment uh, as uh, much as possible no matter whether it's for surgery, whether it's for rehabilitation. So the obvious question is uh, whether robotics uh, meet needs. So you have seen some of the very good examples. I don't know whether anyone in this room want to wear some of the exoskeletons shown in this picture. Many of say, uh, you may say, oh, no, I don't want, and this doesn't look great if I put it on my body. So there's a lot of work uh, still needs to be done uh, from the design, uh, from personalization, from intelligence, and safety, etc. Okay. That's the next one. So I always want to show you this slide and emphasize uh, the importance of science before the development of technologies. So as engineers, we are very keen to develop solutions but I want to emphasize the importance of science, including brain science, musculoskeletal science, sometimes including cognitive science, before we develop solutions to address the problems of disability. Okay, I, I always think that we can do much better than uh, some of the solutions that we have available now, like the traditional uh, wheelchair. Some people with disability but don't have any support to support uh, the daily life. Uh, so in Leeds, we have a large center that we're trying to develop uh, different uh, robotic solutions to address some of the key challenges in robotics. Uh, we have identified the 10 biggest challenges in robotics. We're trying to address some of the uh, challenges from uh, and the development of new materials, for example, for sensing, and uh, for soft robotics, we're also trying to develop uh, bio-hybrid, bio-inspired robotics that mimic uh, uh, different biosystems, uh, like the human ankle. We're trying to develop uh, exoskeletons that mimic how human ankle works and then use it for rehabilitation. Uh, we're trying to also develop AI for robotics to make sure uh, robots are intelligent enough to be used for assistive or rehabilitation purposes. Uh, uh, one of the other challenges uh, you can see is the brain-computer interface. We also looked into the development of new brain-computer interfaces so that we can use 
the brain signal to interact with uh, uh, robots uh, to uh, facilitate uh, rehabilitation. Uh, with the time given, I'm going to share uh, with you some of the examples that we developed uh, at the University of Leeds. Um, we have uh, developed uh, robotic platforms, as you can see in this picture, uh, for upper limb rehabilitation. Uh, and this is specifically designed for stroke patients with one side affected. We looked at uh, the use of the healthy side or to help with the affected side. Okay. So this robotic platform has sensors, actuators uh, built in uh, with interactive games that the patient can uh, interact with. Okay. And after each session, there will be a digital report that we generate okay, to look at the improvement, the difference that we make with the robotic platform to compare uh, uh, today with yesterday, with one week before, or with one month before. Okay. So not just this upland robotic platform, we also developed a specific wrist rehabilitation robot. Look at the wrist motion. We started with cerebral palsy patient, and then we looked into other patients with neurological disease. This is a picture of the first version of this robot used in the hospital. We have tested over 15,000 stroke patients for the first and around 8,000 uh, patients for the second device. Um, we are also um, one of the active groups uh, are work, uh, are worked on the ankle uh, rehabilitation robot. As you can see from this picture, one of my research fellows uh, used his ankle for uh, testing this ankle robot. It can achieve all the range of motion, uh, can also do uh, force uh, control. Uh, the potential users can be um, stroke patients uh, with drop foot, uh, cerebral palsy patient, can be people with sports injuries. Okay, if you play soccer, if you play ice hockey, 100% you have uh, ankle uh, injuries. Okay, so other examples, then we extended from the ankle joint to incorporate with uh, the knee joint and the hip joint to help people walk properly. Okay, so we extended our work to uh, gait rehabilitation robot, and then and this is one of my uh, previous uh, PhD student and research fellow uh, uh, working on an exoskeleton. So not just exoskeletons, we're also actively working uh, for variable sensors for motion detection. So this is an example of a fabric sensor that we developed at the University of Leeds to measure how a human joint moves. This is with one finger, uh, with the s fabric sensor you put in there, you can write whatever you want, and then we we'll directly input into the computer. Okay. So the theory behind, I don't think we have time to go into, but I'm ha more than happy to talk to you uh, later on. So if we have a robot uh, that you wear, and the next question is, how do we make sure that the robot communicates with human um, without any problem? So we develop technology to look at motion intention estimation. So I have a video to share how this works, but this is one of my students. Uh, she has sensor put on her uh, uh, arm to look at the muscle reactions. And then we have a mechanical robotic arm to compare with her movement. Okay, so this is just a short video to show how that works, hopefully. So you can compare the difference and we're able to estimate not just position, but speed and also force. And this will facilitate the communication between the robot and also the, the, the user. On top of the muscle measurement, we we'll also look at the brain measurement. So we use brain measurement to communicate with our robots and exoskeletons. You can see one of my students uh, using his uh, uh, brain signal to control the movement of the robot. So we also worked uh, actively to uh, uh, deliver effective reha rehabilitation in residential settings, especially in, 
during COVID period. So we look at uh, rehabilitation robots in people's homes, uh, uh, doctors in hospitals to look at how we deliver rehabilitation remotely, not just training, but also assessment. Okay, I think we are there, almost there. I don't want to go through the conclusion. I would like to thank uh, all my collaborators and partners and people in the team for the support. And also would like to thank uh, Jeff is over there, Professor Weigau and Professor Zoram for the nomination for this fellowship. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions. Thank you. I, th I mean, uh, some of the examples you showed there, you can imagine that the technology is amazing. Can, can you think of examples where, where you could really sort of scale up in terms of a mass, you know, the, a, a, a scale of a robot that, that many people could have rather than a few? Are there examples of that yet? Very good question. I mean, uh, due to um, differences between patients, personalization is one of the issues. But we have been working on a, on a project in the UK to deliver uh, reconfigurable exoskeletons for stroke treatment in home environment. By reconfigurable, it means that we can have exoskeletons modular and then you can configure a robot based on a specific patient, based on patient's needs. And if you, if you make that possible, then it is possible to uh, scale, uh, up. scale up and, and can be used to by a lot of patients. Very cool. Okay. Other questions? Thanks again for that uh, <laughs> talk. It, it has so many facets to it, and I'm often wondering, uh, to follow up to that previous question, how individual a lot of this is, because you know, when someone's injured, I guess the idea is that the robotics will help them with repetitive things, re rehabilitate their pathways and that, but things like proprioception with drop foot, you're talking often just very, very small distances, the, dis the difference between tripping and not tripping and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It must be... I mean, I guess the real question is, is, is how individual is that and, and how successful is it in rehabilitating those pathways? I guess there's all these the grade of injuries that you might get, but, you know, it, it looks good when you see somebody doing it, but how successful is it in that rehabilitation on it and how individual is it? Yeah, yeah. Very good question. I mean, uh, uh, the truth is, uh, in reality, they are so different. Every patient is different. And when the when they receive robotic treatment, and the effectiveness also different. So one of the examples that we tested with the with the uh, uh, bilateral robotic platform is uh, uh, we have uh, uh, evaluated over fifteen thousand different stroke patients. Uh, each of them, uh, the progress is different. Uh, we record all the progress, the force that they contribute, the type of gains that went through. And, and depends on the training, depends on the patient's condition, how fast they recover will be all different. So that is one of the challenges to address the differences uh, between patients to make sure everybody can uh, be recovered uh, uh, faster. So uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, work uh, to, to be done to make sure that uh, clinical evidence that can support the robotic uh, tre treatment. So, uh, um, unfortunately, in this area, there's still uh, limited uh, large scale clinical studies. That's what we are doing now to uh, um, not just focus on the development of the prototypes, but uh, after we uh, um, move on to the next stage to say that we have tested over uh, 10,000, then we can look at much larger scale. And then we can look at the effectiveness, and then we can create a large uh, database so that we can share right, with different c conditions. Then you can draw somebody with similar 
uh, kind of uh, 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 injuries or, or similar disabilities, how they're treated before and their effectiveness, that kind of knowledge then may be also applied to uh, 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 people with similar background.